good to be together as two congregations today, Faith and Bethel. Really this fall, 40 years ago this fall, right, there was a birth in this congregation, and now we just feel so old, our child's 40. It's just <laughs> wonderful to get together the last Sunday of June and now the last Sunday of July in these summer months, and just to together relax, celebrate that we share one Savior, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one mission in Sioux Center and in the world around us. And we'll be doing each of those things tonight. As we do that, and with those words of welcome, I just would like to invite us to quiet our hearts after a Sunday and to ask for God's blessing on the service together. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, after a day of rain and of sun, a day of rest and of, for some of us, necessary labor, we thank you that we could begin this day in your presence in worship, that we could end this day together corporately in worship, and that we could go into this week to worship you in each of the parts of our lives that we offer to you now, our work, our play, our families, our relationships. Father, may we reflect on who you are tonight, a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who lives in unity with yourself and calls us to live in unity with one another. Father, we thank you for the gift of this night and the gift of fellowship too. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, would you please stand for our call to worship? Call to worship this evening are those familiar words of Psalm 133. How good and pleasant it is when brothers and sisters live together in unity. It is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down the collar of his robes. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. I shared with the council, I had an image of this text before I was coming. I was walking out the door and I experienced the dew of Hermon running down my robe as my daughter spit up. And the image of a God who sees the unity of this place and is so excited, it's like an overflowing experience of his blessing. That's what God calls us to experience today in our worship. And with that before us, let's sing about the God who comes to us. Come thou, almighty king, number 246. the triune God we've just worshipped is the God who brings this word of greeting. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each of you now and forevermore. Amen. As God's people gather in his presence, would you spend some moments greeting one another, especially from each other's congregations.
great to hear the fellowship. Um, the two deacons from Faith and Bethel got together and to support dairy farmers, we're going to have ice cream Sundays afterwards. And so I want to just invite you to continue that fellowship we've experienced. We can now continue in worship, singing to our great God who's come among us. All creatures of our God and King, stanzas one through four. of our God and King, lift up your voice and with us sing. Will you please join me in a responsive reading of Psalm 8? O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. From the lips of children and infants, you have ordained praise because of your enemies, to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place. What is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the angels and crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. 
You put everything under his feet, all flocks and herds and the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, all that swim in the paths of the seas. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. It is always a joy to get together with Bethel and Faith because one of the things that I so much enjoy, and I have heard it from a number of you, is when we sing together. It just fills the room and it fills our souls and it's a picture of that glory to come when we sing in front of the throne. What a day that will be 
It's something to look forward to as we sing God's graces together, as we all come together before the throne of the triune God. What a blessing. Amen? Amen. Thank you. Do they do that here often? Say amen. Because I'm not, I'm not going to get, that's going to be good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but that's good. Um, before I begin, I need to describe to you a little bit about our thing about faith. Some of you know because Pastor John took up, took up the object lesson challenge when he was there. Um, what I do is I give a box and the family takes the box or an individual takes the box. It has rules on it and they put an object in that box. And once they have an object in the box, I reveal it Sunday morning and then my job is to come up with an object lesson based on that box or that thing in in that box. Last week I gave it to Lincoln Russ. Lincoln Russ brought a bust of Lincoln this morning. So I'm not sure how it's going to fit, but uh, to be honest, Lincoln, I think I'm working it in two times today. So that's pretty good. Please turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. If you want to turn in the back to uh, our Belgian Belgic Confession, Articles 8 and 9, the number is on your bulletin. And as we begin... I want to tell you a little story. Perfect. When I lived in Las Vegas, Nevada for eight years, quite a long time ago now, one of my favorite hobbies was seeing how many different bumper stickers I could find. It was a joy and a half. I mean, I drive around, we had one of those little Lumina Chevy vans that looked like a dust buster. So I'm driving that around and you'd see all these stickers, you'd see all these different things on people. There's a little bit of hippie in all of us. I've seen that one before. Uh, so many, so many books, so little time. Uh, I had a life, but my job ate it. I love the middle one. Your stick figure family was delicious because everybody had a stick. How many people have a stick figure family on their car? They're not raising their hands. No, you know, all right. But we see that. And then so I, I love driving around and seeing that because Vegas was varied in all these different opinions. But I came across this one once. I'm driving along, and this big old truck comes flying by, and it has this big sticker on the back and on the windows, and, I, and it said this. It was Trinity with the wind crossed about it, and it went flying by me. Did I just see what I saw? Because I went, what? And so I revved that Chevy Lumina van as fast as I could, caught up to that van, and I'm looking at him going, oh, that's true. It's, it's Trinity with a line through it. That blew me away because I had never till that moment came across somebody that didn't believe in the Trinity. I know it's not listed in Scripture. I know the word Trinity is not put in there. But when you read Scripture, you see it all the time, don't we? So I went home and I started to searching that. And there were those who claimed that the Trinity is not real because it's not mentioned. And I kept thinking, how do you not believe in the Trinity? I know it's hard to understand. I mean, when we think about um, the Belgian Confession, look at that, um, what, um, the Belgian Confession number eight. I'm just going to read this if you could follow along. It is evident that then, then that the Father is not the Son, and the Son is not the Father, and likewise the Holy Spirit is neither the Father nor the Son. Nevertheless, these persons thus distinct are neither divided nor fused nor mixed together. For the Father did not take on flesh, nor did the Spirit, but only the Son. The Father was never without the Son, nor without the Holy Spirit. Since all these are equal from eternity in one and the same essence, there is neither the first nor our last, for all three are one, in truth and power and goodness and mercy." See, we see this written about, described in the Belgian Confession. And to be honest, it's these words that I don't think can completely explain the Trinity. I think we have this wonderful gift of this triune God, and we don't completely understand it or can comprehend it with our finite brains. We have this difficulty in grasping it, but we have this truth that is here with us today. This truth that is so full, as it says in... Article 9, all these things we know from the testimonies of Holy Scripture, so we accept them, as well as from the effects of the persons, especially from those we feel within ourselves. The testimonies of the Holy Scriptures, which teach us to believe in this Holy Trinity, and although this doctrine surpasses human understanding, we nevertheless believe it now, through the Word waiting to know and enjoy it fully in heaven. Furthermore, we must note that particular works and activities of these three persons in relation to us. 
Yes, it surpasses human understanding. It's hard for us to grasp, but we can still experience it. We can can feel within ourselves the effects of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, which each person within the Trinity relates to us in community as we relate to it and as we relate to each other. The Trinity is important. I hope you see that this evening at the end of this message because it has to do with who you are, who we are, and who we are to become and what God calls us to do. Because without the Trinity, I don't think we have really anything. But let's look at the text. But before we do, let's pray. Father God in heaven, Jesus, our Savior, Holy Spirit, our Comforter, Triune God, We ask that you would speak to us. We ask that you would make known your truth to us and that you would speak through the the slow of tongue and the dull of mind and that you would help our ears and our hearts hear. Because, Lord, it's easy to be distracted. It's easy, Father God, for us to fall into the routines of what's going on tomorrow, what's going to happen this week, what am I going to have for lunch after we get done, who am I going to talk to? Lord, we fill our minds with so many things. But tonight is about filling our hearts and our minds and our thoughts and our hands, everything of who we are, with you, the triune God. So I pray that we would listen. And we pray that you would speak. We pray this in Jesus' name. We say it together. Amen. So Ephesians chapter 3, we're looking at verses 20. Um, sorry. There we are. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. And it says these words. Oh, I'm sorry. For this reason, I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have the power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all faithfulness of God. Oh, sorry. I'm not, this is a different one. There we go. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. People of God, the word of God. Thanks be to God. Tonight we're going to have three points and they're there for you to remember them. The first one is, that's my dad. The second one is a cheesy 80s song. And the third one is an empty vessel. Because as we talk about the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we have to understand or get to know who they are and what they mean to us individually before we understand what they mean to us all together. So the first one is this story about that's my dad. And this is Noah Lee, our our oldest, who will be 21 next month. And this was when he was five or six, seven or eight, I don't remember. But Noah, when he was young, loved to wander. He loved to go to a park and he goes, I don't need you, I got this. And he'd just go take off and do whatever he wanted. And we'd have to kind of, one of us would take the other ones and we'd follow him along. You know how that goes, parents, right? And he's kind of never checks on you, I got this, I can do it. And Well, he got to this slide at the park. It was winter in Vegas, so it was nice out. Everybody had, it was, it was going to be like 60 degrees or even 50 and people had parkas on. And people are weird out there, it's just kind of crazy. But you're sitting there and, and he's, he's all excited because he sees this slide. And he climbs up this slide, doesn't look around, he goes down. It's this big, twisty slide. But he didn't know, coming up to the back of the slide, at the front of the slide, where the slide ended, there stood about six or seven of these punk, goth, I don't know what they were, gentlemen. They had to be in their teens. They're smoking. They're dressed in black. Some have spiked hair. Some have no hair. They have these dog collars around their neck, all with studs on them. They have big combat boots on. They have, they're just, they're, they're scary looking, right? They look mean and they're smoking. And here comes this little kid and he slides down the midst of them. He looks up and he's like, oh, he didn't expect to get on this slide, go down it. And in the middle of a park, end up in the middle of what he didn't know. 
It took him a little bit. He, he kind of looked around. He, he, you could see he was scared. This was something he didn't prepare himself for. And he, and he could see a little bit. And then all of a sudden he's looking around and he sees me. And he takes a look at them and he gets this look of defiance on his face. I don't know why. And he goes, that's my dad. <laughs> they all turn around. <laughs> so, in other words, Noah... This little boy in the midst of life needed a father figure. Can you believe that? At one time, I dad was the answer to all of his problems. I dad was strong. I could handle anything his life threw at him. I dad, I was, I was dare say cool. It was awesome. But how quickly we know that changes. I, I went from having this huge C on my head to having an S, and it doesn't stand for super for those that you got, got there yet. But that happens in life, doesn't it? But it shows us a point about our Father. We have a Father in heaven. And unlike us earthly fathers, He will never fail us. He will never get too old. He will never get too weak. He will never not be there. His wisdom will never end. His knowledge and truth about life will never quit. And he will not die. That is our father that we can look up and say, that's our dad. That's our Abba father who is with us. There for us every moment of every day. See, this is a prayer these verses and it's a prayer that starts out asking the father to listen and he does father paul is praying he's praying to this father and that idea of father speaks of origin it speaks of creation it speaks of of the one in whom all life has originated from whom every family gets his name their name it speaks of security of strength of blessing it speaks of the source of all that we need, from the air that we breathe every, every moment to the food on our table. It speaks to our very selves. Each one of us is a unique creation as we, uh, of His, and we are His idea. Think of that. You are God's idea. He designed you, put you together. Uh, we together are His idea. It is the Father who defines us, determines us, and as we shall see, transforms us. Who we, are, who we are is His making, His doing. This is our Dad, our Father in Heaven. And He can handle the things of life on our lives, all of them. If He holds the stars, He can definitely hold us. He is this almighty, transcendent God. This idea of transcendence is that God stands outside the universe. Our Father stands outside creation, and He holds it as if in a bowl. And all the universes, all the peoples, all the planets, everything upon our world, He holds it, contains it, bounds it, He guides it. He knows the direction of each swirling universe, every sparrow's flight path, and the number of hairs that are falling from our very heads. And we can trust him because, as I said, he will never give up. He will never stop loving us. He will never leave us nor forsake us because he's in the midst of our valleys with us that we slide unexpectedly into. And we look around. We don't know where to turn. And the only thing we can do is say, that's my dad. That's my father in heaven. That is the one I trust in because he has me. He has us in the midst of this valley that we are walking in, in the midst of this tragedy that we are facing. And he will hold us just as he holds everyone. This God of the universe, this transcendent God who desires to be involved with your life. As dads, dads, we desire to be involved in our children's life. To pass on that wisdom. To be part of what they are and who they are. And, and sometimes, you know, as they get older, it seems like there's distance. God has that same desire. He wants to be involved in our lives. Because then why would he have sent Jesus, the second person of the Trinity? Why would he come himself when we sin? If he didn't want to be involved and he didn't care. 
See, now we need to leave this second part of this first part of the Trinity God because we have to understand that in his love, the Father, when we turned our backs on him, when we said we know better, we think better, when his creatures and creation was ripped from him because of sin, he didn't give up on us. He wasn't going to stop loving, as I said, but as I said, he sends Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity. Jesus, our Savior. Jesus, our hero. Thus, the cheesy 80s song by, I believe it was, yeah, Bonnie Tyler, which says, I need a hero. I, I promised my wife I wouldn't sing, so I'm not going to do it. All right? And you, I don't want to put you through that torture. But it's one of these cheesy 80s songs, and, and you can listen to it, and, well, ain't all 80s songs cheesy? But you think about it, and you can listen to it, and it's fun, but there's a truth in it. We all need a hero. We all have heroes. We might suppose that Lincoln Russ has this, sorry, Lincoln, you're leaving Thursday, so I could bring you up a lot today. Lincoln has a hero, which is Lincoln the president, Right? And he sets Lincoln upon his shelf because then Lincoln, he could look at him and go, there's my hero. There's the one I want to emulate. This is the one I want to pattern my life after. And he sets him on a shelf and he comes to understand who he is. That's the kind of hero we might need once in a while. But Jesus is more than that kind of hero. Jesus is a hero that we need when we don't even understand that we need him. And that's because of sin. That's because we can't save ourselves, and you know this, from sin. We can't change that. We can't make that happen in our lives. We can't become somebody different. Sin has us, and it controls us, and it's in us, and it's in our language, in our thoughts. It's everywhere that we are. And so Jesus comes, the transcendent God becomes a man. A man, it means with us, near us. Think about that. Without the Trinity, we would not know this awesome truth about God, that he is a God who holds the universe and at the same time is with us and came to us because he loved us. That's amazing. That's a wow thing that we should just be overwhelmed by with joy and humbleness. That God willingly did that. Jesus came. And he's a hero that doesn't swoop in and then fly off after he says it, saves us. No, this prayer here is a prayer for Jesus, in essence, to permeate our lives. To become part of the very fabric who we are. So that we are somebody different from the inside out. From our inner being, the gut, our thoughts, where we have that control center in our minds. Where we make our decisions. That Jesus is so much a part of who we are, such a strong influence at the core of who we are, that our lives show Jesus, they live for Jesus, they, uh, we have a heart, mind, soul, and strength for Jesus. Our hero, we exemplify, we copy, and we live the life he calls us to, the life that reflects who he is. That's how much Jesus is, is supposed to become part of who we are. That's what Paul is praying, that Jesus becomes so much a part of the life of the church. Because when Christ dwells, we are rooted. When Christ dwells, we are established, we are planted, we are built up, strong, anchored, not easily shaken. We have a firm place to stand because he plants us, puts us squarely in his love, and he will not let us go. How many of us as dads and moms, you have this too. When our kids are younger, and we're not going to admit this because that's the mom's job to cry when they leave the house, not ours. But you sit there and you're holding and you're, you have your kids and the older they get, the farther away they get from you in essence. They don't hold your hand anymore. They don't want you to hug them. They don't want you necessarily to be around when their friends come over. And there's a distance that grows. Sometimes because of our independence or our supposed independence, it's the same. We start to drift away from God. Start to go our own way. And the Lord says, no, no, I sent Jesus and I'm planting you, establishing you in the midst of my love. 
A love that will never end. A love that will never be quenched. A love that will never be extinguished. A love that will go on forever and ever and ever and ever. And I will plant you there. And I will not let you go. And it takes a while for us to understand in life that this love, the love of the Father in Jesus Christ, that should permeate who we are, is the wellspring of our lives. It is the foundation upon which we stand. Not only stand, it is the foundation upon which we act, we move, we live. Because when we're loved, when we're loved, when those love tanks are full, we can do anything. We can face anything. We can go forward with what God has it. We know his love. We are strong. We have right minds. We act and we act in his truth. So that brings us to this idea then, if that love we need to be planted in, and Jesus needs to permeate our life, the second person of the Trinity, that the Father sent him, how does that happen? How do we become filled? Which leads us to the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. And our example tonight is an empty vessel. An empty cup. Or an empty person. You see, Lincoln might put this on his shelf because it's this golden bust of Lincoln. But in fact, it's not. It sits in his bathroom. Because it's not a bust or anything, it is a, um, a cologne bottle. And it's funny, when you turn off the bottom, it's from Avon, but it says President Washington. <laughs> Wild country aftershave. Woo. You were a happening kid in the past, weren't you, Lincoln? But, and you should smell, whoa, it is pretty strong. But you should think about this. This cologne bottle is not a cologne bottle unless there's cologne in it. Without cologne in it, it's just an empty vessel. With Lincoln on the outside. When we have a cup, a cup of water, or that cup's not a cup of water until there's water in it. When we have a can, it's not a can of Coke unless there's Coke in it. In other words, we're defined at times by what's in us and what comes out of us. And our God in heaven understands because of sin, we have been filled with all the wrong stuff. And we constantly are filled with those things. We are constantly struggling with those things. We have the sins, our desires, our wants, but also fear and worry and doubt and frustration and anger. Hate. Bitterness. We look at people and we have the thoughts we shouldn't have. We, we secretly say one thing to them and gossip about them on the side. The Lord understands, our Father understands that we are full of something we shouldn't be full of, which marks us, which shapes us, which says we are sinners. But see, the Lord wants to fill us. Because what we are filled with determines who we are, what we do, how we handle life, how we live life. If we're filled with sin, we live for sin. If we're filled with self, same thing. We live for self, but it's also sin. See, God has a purpose in this filling. Look at the beginning of our text, verse 14. He says, for this reason I kneel before the Father. What is the reason? Go back up to verses 10 through 11 a moment. This is God's intent. This is why Paul's praying the prayer. His intent was that now through the church, you and I, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In other words, we are called to be those who go out into the world in our every day and we speak and proclaim Christ. But if we're not filled with the right stuff, if we're not filled with the right things, we can't do that. If we're filled with ourself, or filled with fear, or filled with doubt, filled with sin, filled with our evil wants and desires, our human ways of doing things, we can't. God understands this. 
He's created us for this purpose, to be the church, to be those who give him glory. To make his truth known in the world, the gospel of Jesus Christ to others, to share Jesus as we live for him in the midst of all the things we're called to do. So he needs to fill us, and as he fills us, he's going to transform us. And sometimes, folks, that's a lifetime process. He knows that us vessels seem to fill up on anything and everything and all the stuff we're not meant to fill up on. We've been created to fill up on this love, this truth, the spirit of God that comes. We've been, we've been created to be filled up with this unity of community in the Trinity and with each other. There's so much joy in the Father. When he fills his children and they live together in unity, as Pastor John was speaking of, and they serve God hand in hand, arm in arm. There's joy on the father's face. Is there not joy on our faces as parents when our kids walk with the Lord? It's the greatest joy. And it gives God joy to see his people doing the same thing. And so he will equip us to do so. He will transform us. So the Spirit's job, the third person of the Trinity, is to fill us empty vessels. <clears throat> and in filling us, He roots us, establishes us, strengthens us, and transforms us. By the Spirit, we know truth, we know love, we know Jesus. We can comprehend it, understand how great and awesome, how wide, how long, how deep and how high that love is that he has for us. Because he reveals it. The problem is we don't listen. The problem is we have that noise of the world, that noise of our life, the worries, whatever it might be. That fill our time and energy, our, our eyes and our ears and we can't hear it because God, God wants to pour himself into us. He wants to permeate you with Jesus Christ. He wants his spirit to be poured in so you know this love. He wants you to know that he has you. He loves us. And in Christ he has saved us. And in the spirit now we are transformed to live for him to be the church. Beloved, this is our God, our triune God, that is pictured for us here in this prayer. And the doxology, verses 20 through 21, call us, this is our application this evening, call us, you and I, to consider and think about our God, our triune God. <clears throat> This God who is all-powerful, able, and beyond your expectations. In fact, he is, doesn't fit the limitations of your expectations, but goes even beyond those. He does more than we ask or imagine. And he is that triune God who is at work in us and eager to do so, to achieve his purposes for salvation in this world, in our lifetime, and beyond. For each consecutive generation that comes. Because a generation ago, as I said a month ago, you had the grace and the knowledge and the truth that God led you to the Father to plant a church called Faith. And we together are his witnesses as he leads and he guides us. Consider your God this week. Consider the truth of the Trinity. Because it's not false, it's not man-made, it's biblical. And we need it. And also consider yourselves in it this week, too, because just a few things in closing, some things to consider. Number one, you are not an independent being. If we believe in the Trinity, you are not an independent being. You are not self-determined, self-fulfilled, or independent of the triune God. But we are to be independent of everything else but God. Secondly, our lives are to be found in Him and nowhere else. Because the Christian life is a life of engagement with God through his spirit who makes Christ and his purposes known to those whom he fills. Number three, you have to understand you need to be active in this filling. It just doesn't happen. We don't just go home and sit there and go, okay, God, fill us. No, we need to get into relationship with him. Just as we want to be in relationship with our kids, when they're younger, we get down on our knees in the sandbox with them. As they get older, we try and spend time with them. As they become adults themselves, we're there for them. 
We are actively pursuing that relationship with our children as we should actively pursue our relationship with Christ. We actively mean to do our devotions, pray, come to worship, study His Word, invest in that relationship, be part of that, and understand that our inner selves require as much exercise or even more than our physical bodies. The world tells us, exercise your body, be healthy physically, but are we truly healthy spiritually? Number four, be the church. This is a needed prayer, and it's a dangerous prayer. It's dangerous because as we pray this, it calls us into the world where we'll have opposition. Paul is writing in the midst of his sufferings this prayer for others to come and join him. And then it's a needed prayer because the church is always not always willing to join him. And lastly, may I encourage you to this. I would encourage you to pray for one another. This prayer. Find somebody in your church. Don't even have to tell them. And you start praying this prayer for them. That they would, the Father would come into their life, permeate their life with Jesus Christ, fill them with the Spirit. Help them to grasp how wide, deep, and long the love of God is. And they would be filled to that measure, that wonderful measure, the fullness of God. And move forward in what he has for them. Do that for each other in your churches and do it for churches. Pick somebody from faith, people from Bethel. Bethel, faith, pick somebody from Bethel. John, I am promising right now, for the next year, until we meet again as churches, I'm going to pray that for you. Once in a while, not every day, but once in a while. I'm going to commit to that. Are you? Can, can you imagine? Because we need this spirit that if we prayed this for each other, what would happen? What would take place in our churches, in our community, in the world? And I'm losing my voice, so i got to quit. Can you imagine if we prayed this prayer? And pray it because we want to be called to what God wants us to do, but also pray it because for most of us, a lot of us, we understand. We understand that our lives are filled with pain, they're filled with tragedy, and they're filled with evil. So pray that each of us knows that we are held by our Father in heaven. We are saved by Jesus Christ and are being filled and transformed by the Spirit. And we are never, ever alone, but our triune God is with us. And all God's people say it together, Amen. Let's pray. Father, we come to you. We come to you, Father God, and we ask as we kneel before you. We pray that out of the glorious riches that you may strengthen each of us with power through your spirit in your inner being. And we pray that you, dear Jesus, would dwell in our hearts through faith. And that we would be rooted and established in love and may have the power together with all of us, each other, how to gra grasp how wide and long and high and deep that love is and that we are held by that love and never let go. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge so that each of us may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand to join us in singing Praise the Father, Praise the Son as the music begins.
And with that, we come to our Father in prayer. And at Bethel, often in the evenings, we take prayer requests. If there are items of celebration we want to share, items of petition we want to lift together. I know with a bigger group and two churches, it might be scary to do so. But I want to get opportunity. Yeah, Bob. Prayers for the Sotsma family from our Valley. Sotsma family. Jacob Sotsma was hurt yesterday, yesterday, I think this week, in a um, four-wheeler accident. He is on life support. Okay, so Sotsma family in Rock Valley, you said Jacob? Jacob Jacob was in a four-wheeler accident and is on life support, so very serious. I don't know if you know that story. I don't know much about it. We want to pray for the Sotsma family and for Jacob. Anything else? Yeah, Neil. Yeah. So our offering after the prayers for the gospel mission in Sioux City, we want to pray for that, but also for locally, Center for Financial Education and Atlas and uh, the food pantry here, all the different ministries. Yeah. Very good. Anything else? Yeah, Martha. Yeah. So we, we as a congregation support a daughter of our congregation, um, Miranda and Pastor Vasia. I don't know if do people from Faith know Miranda used to be uh, well, well, Hogland. Yeah. So um, but they've adopted or are, have three foster kids and the mother of those kids have just had a two month old daughter that she's not able to care for. And so they're considering taking her in. But to do that, they need a larger house. And so they're trying to uh, look at options um, to, to go to a different part of town in a larger house. We want to pray. Uh, for that family, with a very, just a huge amount of, of, of work and, and calling in front of them. So, in Ukraine. Good. Anything else for prayer? Yeah, Mandy. Uh, my cousin's husband was diagnosed with, with leukemia a couple of weeks ago, and he just got done with two rounds of treatment, um, and it, his body's responding really well to it. Okay. And what's his name? Seth. Seth. Praying for uh, Mandy's, uh, her cousin's husband, Seth, has been diagnosed with leukemia, has been through a couple of rounds of treatment, and yet just a young man want to pray for that, um, for those treatments to be blessed by God and for healing for Seth. Good. Anything else? Yeah, Dave. So one of the, thanks for her marriage for Jess and uh, coming up. Um, yeah, exciting, exciting news. I just it's exciting you can be here after the, the journey you've been on. So, yeah. 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 So we want to pray for Joshua at Dort. Uh, teaches, I think, mathematics, chemistry. Sorry, yeah. Um, and you know, trying to get a visa back in China. And uh, yeah, I just want to pray for for that. His wife is here, and he has three kids. They just had a baby, right? So yeah, I want to pray for Joshua and for his family and for visa. So thank you. Good. Anything else? Yeah, Sean. Okay. So we're praying for Thea's family who will be coming in from Indonesia, have never uh, come to the U.S., and so just for safe travels and, uh, yeah, blessing as they spend some time together with you. So a yeah, reminder, both of these requests, just how small the world is, right, um, and how big our God is. Good. With those things before us, let's, let's come to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the reminder in your word this evening that you are able to do far beyond what we can ask or imagine according to your power at work in Christ Jesus. And so, Father, we do come with these requests we've just named as a family, but also with the requests we haven't named. And we ask that you would do far beyond what we can ask or imagine, even in this time and place. We come to you as our Father, as the one who made this world, who sustains it, who gives the rain and the sun, who even after a difficult spring and planting season has blessed the crops that we see outside 
our windows and in our, our fields. And we just thank you for that blessing and for the reminder that you are a God who provides. Heavenly Father, we thank you as a father that you also are the God who rules not just this nation, but the nations of this world. And so we lay before you some of the requests we've had tonight. We do pray for your favor for Joshua and his family. Whether you would open the door for a visa to be granted that he could continue his ministry of teaching at Dort. That this family that has experienced your blessing in this community after grad studies in Georgia would experience also that you would allow them to continue to be here, to continue to grow in you, to serve you. And Heavenly Father, that you would work in the officials who have to make those decisions and that you would help them to receive, again, your leading and your favor. But we also thank you with Thea and Sean as they approach, uh, again, this, this time of marriage and as Thea's family travels for the first time in the United States to see even this community where she has spent four years as a student, we pray that you would help this travel to go well, that you provide what is needed, that you would just bless this time as family, and that as we as brothers and sisters acknowledge that all families on this earth derive from you, that as these families gather together, they also would experience you, our Father. We also thank you that your power is made perfect in weakness and that you showed who you are, Father, in the coming of your son, Jesus. We thank you for the way that we've seen in his life and death, the power of your love and sacrifice, the reminder of forgiveness of sin, the reminder that you are a God who is near to the brokenhearted. Heavenly Father, we just pray for the Sotsma family and for Jacob. Even as he is on life support this evening, we ask that you, the incarnate God, would surround this family, that you, the Savior who healed so many, even raised the dead, would work in his body, that you would bring a miracle of healing, if that's your will, that you would restore him. Heavenly Father, we just commend Jacob and this family to your hands. We do also thank you, Lord, uh, with Jess for bringing her through, uh, even now to this anticipation of marriage, and just for the glory and the wonder of you, a God who makes man and woman into one new flesh. And we pray your blessing on this marriage. We pray your blessing on life as it opens up through marriage into a new season of experiencing your love, experiencing even as Christ loved his church and gave himself up for her, the wonder of our story as your people in Christ. Holy Spirit, we do thank you also that you have been sent from the Father and the Son and that you work in this world, moving among us in the work that we do in our jobs and in our studies and in our callings as single people or as husbands and wives, as fathers and mothers. Heavenly Father, we do pray that you would send your Spirit today to do your good work. We pray that you would bless the gospel mission as we give offerings for it, that this mission would be a place where people can experience the love of Christ, experience Christ's name, the name that is through which we find salvation shown to them, and that you would even use this ministry not just to bring your mercy, but to bring salvation. Father, we pray in our own community for the Center for Financial Education, for Atlas, for our food bank, for Justice for All, for all the different organizations and even the deacons of our two churches who are at work in our community to bring the same power of the Spirit, the same message of the gospel, in word and deed to our communities. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Miranda and for Pastor Vasi in Ukraine, bringing the same message of your kingdom coming through your Spirit. We pray that you would open the right space for them, if this is your will, to adopt this little two-month-old baby, that you provide space and home ho housing for their children and for this, uh, these foster children and this uh, new one. Whether you give them strength as they seek to parent and to raise up a church and to do ministry in their community, so many things exhausting to consider apart from your strength and your blessing on them. Heavenly Father, we just thank you that we can bring these prayers to you. We thank you that you are a triune God who rules, who has sacrificed himself, who is with us always. So Father, hear and receive the prayers we offer together as two congregations in you. Receive our offerings now and bless them for your kingdom's purpose. Father, we pray these things in Jesus' strong name, and all of us say, amen. amen. Our offering tonight is for the Sioux City Gospel Mission. Many of us have volunteered or know what that mission is. May God bless us as we trust our ministry of money to them.
Friends, we experience the gift of unity tonight as two congregations, but also with congregations around the world and across the ages. Let's stand and confess our faith together as summarized in the Apostles' Creed, the shared faith. Saying together, I believe in God the Father, Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. That profession reminds us of our triune God and who he is. Let's respond, who you say I am.
happens, we leave this place to congregations to serve God in this community, in this world. We go with God's blessing, and our closing song reminds us that there is a Redeemer. And after we sing that song, if I had to go, there would be ice cream served out of the kitchen. You're on receiving the fellowship hall, go outside, but spend some time fellowshipping with one another as we finish this Lord's Day together. But first, this parting blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace. Amen.